start out this morning uh, with a little disclosure. I always do this when I preach about this. If you have a child in here under the age of about mm, fifth grade, I want you to consider utilizing our dynamic children's ministry this morning. We are going to have what I call a PG-13 service. We're going to be talking about sex and morals, and here's the deal. Um, I have a 10-year-old who would be sitting here this morning if he was here. Um, I'm not going to say anything that goes outside of Scripture, but it's not my job to parent your child. It's not school's job to parent your child. It's your job to parent your child. So if you don't want them hearing about all of this, uh, kids' ministry is raring and ready to go. They're waiting on you if you want to ease into that. I know that this topic, I put it out on Facebook, and there are some very nervous people in here this morning. Um, I've, I've had questions all week. They're like, uh, what are you talking about? What are you going to say? I just want to ease your mind a little bit, although Cassie's not here yet, and she's usually the one that keeps me uh, from saying too much uh, that's not good. Um, my mom and dad are here, so I won't say anything in front of my mama <laughs> that's going to embarrass me. But if you haven't met them, they're sitting back here in the back left corner. They're going to be hanging out with me after the service. They would love to meet you guys. They're going to be in town for a couple of months. We're in the middle of a relationship series, and it's called It's Not Complicated. And here's what I've learned over, over about 13 years of counseling, that all relationship issues, whether it's through marriage or whether it's a work relationship, whether it's friends, whether it's family, in-laws, all relationships, we were built for relationships, and our entire life is surrounded by relationships. They, it, it ingrains in every single thing we do. You can't get away from relationships. This morning, I've titled the message, The Most Uncomfortable Conversation You've Never Had in Church. We're going to talk about some things. See, there's two sides when it comes to sex and morals. One is more for the counseling room. We're not going to get into that side today. The other side is how to guard your relationships. You don't have to look far on the news to see all of the careers, as in from politicians to movie stars to football coaches to teachers. You, you don't have to look far to see all of the careers that are being destroyed by this topic. The verse we're using throughout this whole series, and, I, and I'll kind of dive into that for a second, is 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20. It says this, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. Here's the, I, I love that sentence right there. Here's the deal. The world's got a way they tell us to do it. The Bible has a way it tells us to do it. Here's what I know. Whether you walked in here and you do the God thing or not, if you don't, man, great safe place to be. Love the fact that you're, you're, you're taking steps to figure that out. But here's what I know. Even if you don't buy into the God thing, if we did it the way that the Bible teaches us to do it, think about all of the things that we wouldn't have. We wouldn't have unwanted teenage pregnancies. We wouldn't have abortions. We wouldn't have STDs. There's so many things that if we just did it by the blueprint given to us, it would change the dynamics of relationship. It goes on to say, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligent of the intelligent. You see, people like to look at Christians and think, oh, that's just a backwards. That's just old school. That's so beyond, like we're in the 21st century. That kind of stuff doesn't work until you look at the world right now. And then I would challenge you, is that working? And then it goes on to say, so where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of the world look foolish. And I think it's true. Do it God's way. And do it the world's way. And look at all of the chaos that would be avoided if we just did it God's way. Here's, here's, here's what that verse means. Throughout this whole series, last week we talked about communication. This week we're talking about sex. Next week we're going to talk about finances. And the following week we're going to talk about boundaries. And here's what this verse right here means. The world's way is not working. But I believe that the Bible's way to do it works 100% of the time. But on this topic, I'm going to be honest with you. I think the church has missed it. I think the church has missed the boat on this one in quite a few ways. You see, here's, here's what amuses me is, is I'm relatively new in town. If you're a guest here, I'm the new guy. And, and some of y'all still haven't quite figured it out yet because uh, th there's a perception 
that, you know, the guy is up on stage and he's got ripped jeans or he doesn't wear a coat and a tie. And frankly, I believe that ties are not from heaven. I feel like they're from somewhere else, but we won't get into that. It's a different topic for a different day. But you see all of this kind of, and see, here's the deal. All of that is style. All of that is style. Let me tell you something this morning. I just want you to know, if you walked into church for the first time in a long time, can I tell you something? You're all right with God. You're all right with God. I hear so many times, man, I got to get right before I walk into church. It's actually supposed to look the other, the, the other way. I want to tell you something. I want to free you from religion a little bit this morning. You are all right with God. So many times religion tries to tell us that we're, we're unworthy to, to even be in church. And, and I look at that and I just go, man, you don't have to change before you come to God that God is actually the one that changes. And I think we've missed the boat on it. And, and that, that church is often this place where we have to walk in and we have to position and we have to posture and we have to put on these, these fake masks. Can I tell you something? Religion's been lying to you for a long time. As you sit here in your seat this morning, I don't care if you walked in in board shorts and flip-flops. I don't care if you got a baseball hat. Let me tell you something. You could talk about respect and tradition and maybe that is a topic. But there's nothing biblical. We're just glad you're here. We're just so glad you're here. Come as you are. We're willing to walk with you, whatever your next step is. But when it comes to this topic this morning, there's a, there's a lot of confusion, I think, um, that, that church kind of takes moral high ground on this, right? I, I think a lot of people are, are waiting to see. This is actually one of my most attended messages. I do this every year. Um, I do it every year. And and when I do this, it's always one of the most attended outside of Easter and Christmas. And it amuses me because it's like, I really go, well, what do y'all think I'm going to say? Like God wrote a new book and said, hey, do what you want. Hey, kick the tires. You don't have to do the marriage thing. Hey, you know what? Look at what you want. Be who you want. But the truth is the Bible gives us a clear, very, very, very clear blueprint. And there's some of you in here this morning that, that, that you've made mistakes throughout your, your life. And I want to tell you this morning, don't be afraid of this morning's message. As you sit in the seats, you're all right with God. You really are. We've all made mistakes. But this is where I think that the church actually missed it, is, is we, when it comes to this topic, we will beat our chest in moral high ground. We'll stand in front of abortion clinics and we will scream at the ladies walking out of there and we'll condemn them to hell. And I know some of you right now, you're trying to figure out and you're going to ask me this question. So what are you like pro-choice? That's a stupid question. I am as pro-life as it come. As a matter of fact, those two people sitting in that back corner over there, they adopted me when I was two years old. I am as pro-life as it comes. I was the poster child of a kid who should have got aborted. He was 25, she was 12. So I'm passionate about pro-life. But here's what I'm also passionate about. I'm passionate about those women who walk out of that clinic. Because let me tell you something. I've counseled women who have had abortions for 13 years. And there's nobody that needs the forgiveness, the redemption, and the grace more than those ladies. And there's going to come a time when they're going to go and search for that. The same way each and every one of us have gone and searched for that. And where is the church? We've, we've condemned them to hell on the front end. And then we're like, well, I don't know why they won't come into our place. See, here's the deal. They need the same grace of, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ as we do. And, and while we should, while we absolutely should be against abortion, the truth is we should be for the saving grace and the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, that he can turn those ladies' lives around. And this morning I thought about, man, I, I really thought about but because when you start talking about the moral high ground, I, I thought about giving a bunch of stats when I got in here because I'm a stat guy. I get off on rabbit trails all the time. And I, I thought about giving stats about abortion and, and how one in four ladies, one in four ladies will actually have an, a, have an abortion. And in a room like this of about 300 people, here's what I know, that correlates to about 75. And that's not even counting the guys who have paid for one. So if I look at a room of 300 people, I'm thinking there's probably about 100 people who have been directly affected by that. So when people ask me, why are you talking about this in church? I go, well, why would we not talk about this 
in church. And here's what I know. If you've had that issue, God loves you. God forgives you, and, and he has, you, you have an amazing platform to stand and minister to these women because you can actually change their lives moving forward to keep them from making the same mistake. I thought about rattling off about how the Wall Street Journal lists Alabama as the number two most religious state in America. Did y'all know that? Y'all ranked number two. The only one that's ranked higher is Mississippi, and they need Jesus more than us anyway. But here's the truth. The number two most religious state in the United States. We have a campus right down the road that is actually number four in the entire country for sugar daddy dating trafficking. Did you know that? So to think that it all happens out in California is crazy. To think that trafficking doesn't happen right here in our own backyard is crazy. Did you know that of all the abortions in Alabama, Tuscaloosa County is the producer of half of those? Half. I think last year there were almost 7,000 abortions. So 3,500 abortions happened right here in our own county. We are sitting, TWCC is sitting in one of the greatest mission fields in the United States. But I could keep going with the stats and we could talk about trafficking. We could talk about how the abortion rate is going up. 2015 had 58.99, 2016 had 66.42. Shh, we don't want to talk about that. I could talk about trafficking and how every, every minute two children in the state of Alabama are exploited and it starts at the age of 11. Shh, we don't want to talk about that. See, we better start talking about it. Because when it comes to immorality, it's not just invading our nation. It's not just invading our state. It's invading where we sit this morning. TripleXChurch.tv. And let me tell you, if you go onto that website, make sure you type it in correctly. It is a Christian site. It's called XXX Church. But they list, when it comes to pornography, the number one state in the United States, the number one most religious state in the United States is Mississippi. The number one state that downloaded pornography is Mississippi. The number two religious state in America is Alabama. And the number four most downloaded porn state in America is Alabama. You see, religion does it change the statistics? I would argue that it actually kind of is worse within the church. And here's a really dumb stat that I came across. According to the largest porn site in the world, there is a 90% surge in pornography downloads after the University of Alabama loses. See, y'all don't know whether to laugh at that or not. <laughs> True stat. True stat. That's in our own backyard. And see, I know in church, you, you don't talk about it because it's a dirty little thing, and you don't, because shh, like, like we, we just, that's in our own backyard, guys. That's in our own backyard. And then I like to do this. I thought, well, y'all, y'all don't want to get all tied into stats, so I thought about doing this to just kind of put us all on the same ground and get us all off our moral high horse. I thought about doing this. So everybody who has a cell phone, take them out for me. Just do me a favor. It's fun. Awesome. Take them out. See, y'all ain't never had a preacher say, open your phone during church. Take them out. All right, now I want you to go to your uh, Safari, Google, Chrome, Firefox, go to whatever internet thing that you have. I want you to pull up your history, and then I want you to hand your phone to the person to the left of you. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. See, some of y'all are confident. Some of y'all are flinching right now. No, nah, we're not really going to do that. Actually, what I want you to do is open up your photos. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> see? You see? For some of us, we can stand and we put on this mask when we walk into church. See, some of y'all don't know what to do with today's message. But here's what I know. If we don't talk about it, it's going to destroy your relationships. It can destroy your life. And I think the church has missed the boat on talking about it. See, I grew up in a denominational world. When they talk about sex, it's like, don't, don't, don't. You're going to go, well, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. And then you get married, and they're like, well, what's the problem? And I think we've missed the boat. We've got to talk about it. We've got to talk about the immorality that's creeping across America. We've got to figure out how to guard our relationships, not just our marriages, but how do you have a successful relationship before you get married? How do you guard your relationship? 
work? How do you guard your relationships out in the world? How do you keep your career and your integrity and your relationships intact? And so I thought about doing all the stat stuff, and I thought about doing the phone thing, and then I thought, I really believe by the power of your testimony it can change. So I've got a video. Go ahead and pop that up. If you want real and you want authentic, I suspect that story is in this room as well. I suspect that story is in relationships in this room as well. So that's why we talk about it. Because not done correctly, immorality can destroy every relationship that you have. Immorality can destroy your marriages. It can even destroy your relationships with your children. It can destroy your relationships at work. It can destroy relationships everywhere. And I believe God created sex, right? Like, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's meant to be between a man and a woman within the context of marriage. And when done correctly, it forms an intimate bond. But when done incorrectly, which we see permeate throughout our society today, it doesn't create a bond. It actually destroys relationships. So how do we keep that from destroying our relationships? How do we keep that? Even within the context of the church. Here's the deal. We all walk in and we all play a game on Sunday. But how do we keep that? How do we, how do we take problems and find real solutions? Because like Nate Larkin said, there is a real God and only through Him can we find freedom? This morning, I want to take a look at a, a story. You may have heard of the guy. He actually dealt with some of the same stuff. His name was David. He was the king. He was a, the little squirt that killed the, the big giant. And by the time we get to this part of his life, he's been king for a little while. And so we're going to pick up with the story. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you got your Bibles, if you don't, we're going to throw it on the screen. It says, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and they laid siege to the city of Rabbah. I want to live there. I just like that name. Rabbah. Sorry, rabbit trail. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. We're going to land on that statement for a second. David stayed behind in Jerusalem late one afternoon after his midday rest. David got out of the bed and he was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. One of the ways that we keep immorality out of our relationships, if you've got your blanks on the back, fill this one in. Be where you're supposed to be. Be where you're supposed to be. You see, being at the wrong place at the wrong time often leads to wrong decisions. David at this point should have, as king, as commander of his army, David should have been out with the guys on the battlefield. But instead, for whatever reason, David decided to stay back at the palace. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. There's a guy by the name of Kevin Hart. I don't know how much you keep up with, the, with kind of the society world. There's a guy by the name of Kevin Hart who was married, and he's married to a model, and, and she was pregnant, and he just came across with a scandal. It's kind of like all the, the scandals you're starting to see in Hollywood. And the reason I'm bringing up Kevin Hart is because he actually made a very profound statement when they were interviewing Kevin Hart about his affair with this lady, and his wife's like eight months pregnant, and they're like, how in the world can you do this? Kevin Hart actually said this. He said, I have a target on my back. Because of that, I should make smart decisions. I made a bad error in judgment, and I put myself in an environment where only bad things can happen. Think about that statement for a second. I put myself in an environment where only bad things can happen. If Kevin Hart, if David, if any of those guys were in the place they were supposed to be, you keep that from happening. And then he goes on to say, there's no excuses for my bad behavior. I simply have to do better. Take a flip side guy, and I don't care what side of the political spectrum you land on, right? But take a flip side for a guy who, who is in the right place at the wrong, right place at the right time. The guy by the name of Mike Pence, you may have heard of him. He's kind of the VP of the United States. About six to nine months ago, Mike Pence actually was, was uh, eviscerated in the news. He was eviscerated. They were ripping him to shreds. And the reason that they were ripping him to shreds is Mike Pence made this statement. 
He said, I don't get in a car with a lady who's not my wife. Huh? How could he? I don't get in elevators with ladies who aren't my wife. I don't drink alcohol without my wife there. And that's a whole different statement. We're not getting into that today. But here's the deal. Is Mike Pence determined a long time ago, I'm going to be at the right place all the time. Not the right place some of the time, but I'm going to be in the right place all the time because here's what he knew. If he could create boundaries around his relationships, he wouldn't stumble. But you get guys like Kevin Hart, you get guys like all these movie moguls who are in the wrong place at the wrong time, just like King David was. Wrong place, wrong time leads to wrong decisions. My wife has been out of town for the past couple of weeks. I'm going to tell you, we've got that little 360, find a phone, whatever, track your person. I don't know how it works, but she has it. Because she asked me the other day, she goes, are you eating at Popeye's again? (laughs) I'm like, God, is that you? (laughs) Right place, right time. Create, create boundaries, because here's what I know. If you're in the right place at the right time, it's really hard to make wrong decisions. The story goes on with David, and it says they sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the place, he slept with her. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I am pregnant pregnant. Right place at the wrong time wouldn't have led to a wrong decision, which wouldn't have led. Again, I go back to if we do it God's way, it takes out so many complications. It's not complicated. Here's my second blank for you. Set boundaries. Set boundaries. Set guardrails way before the danger. You see, here's the thing about a guardrail. Guardrails aren't at the edge of the cliff. Guardrails are away from the cliff. A guardrail is something to let you know you're about to be in danger. If you set the guardrail over the edge of the cliff, guess what? The guardrail don't work. Set guardrails. Put people around you. Put accountability partners around you. I had a guy yesterday. He called me up and he said, hey, how's it going? I said, it's going well. He said, your wife's been gone. How's it going? And I said, it's going fine. He said, are you where you're supposed to be? He has that permission to ask me questions. I've got guys in in my world that look at my phone. I've got a wife who knows every code in my phone. She has every password to every social media account that I have. Can I tell you something? Two become one. That should include your accounts. That should include your social media. If you're really struggling with the the porn world, tie your phone into your mom's. (laughs) You'll stop. (laughs) You'll stop. Set boundaries. I was talking with a college student one time, and he was struggling with it. He He said, I put my computer out in the living room where everybody can see that I'm on it. I said, how'd that work? He goes, I I was still dealing with my cell phone. He said, I took the door off of my bedroom. Set boundaries. Bring people into your life. Here's what I know. Everybody in some capacity struggles with it. And you can take the moral high ground all you want to. I know a bunch of y'all have been to Alabama football games. Let me tell you something. Your eyes get tired bouncing so much. We live right down the road from Panama City Beach. Huh. Gulf Shores, we all have some level of struggle. This is something we've got to start talking about. We've got to bring our brothers, we've got to bring our sisters into the conversation so that we can set boundaries. Because here's what I would rather have. I would rather have a few guys know and help me walk through that than to have to stand in front of my wife and explain like that guy had to do. Set hard boundaries far from where you need to be. And here's the most deep theological way in the world to stay away from it. Get away from it. Just get away from it. I know some of y'all are like, and we pay you what? Get away from it. Get as far away from it as you possibly can. Here's a verse. I love this one. It says, run from sexual sin. And it's got an exclamation point. We talked about exclamation points last year. It didn't just say, hey, you know. If you shouldn't be looking at it, nah, you know. See, I used to watch this show. It's called Sons of Anarchy. 
You can judge me all you want. I was at a point in my life when I didn't think that was that big of a deal. I spent a lot of years in the military. I was like, ah, it's not a big deal until my 10-year-old walked by and stood there and started watching it. And the Holy Spirit put on my heart, that's not a good thing to watch. And so what we did, as I told my wife, I said, I, I, I need to have, I, I need to have a, a filter. I need to have a filter. So about 10 years ago, she put a code on our TV. I can't even watch Criminal Minds without asking her. But it's a boundary. Hey, look, I'm a preacher. I need boundaries. I need boundaries. You need boundaries. We all need boundaries. But more than anything, we need to just stay away from it. And I'm not talking about in the context of marriage. Man, God created it. But outside the context of marriage between a man and a woman, we need to run from it. The Bible specifically says run. There's a, there's a, a verse that says flee. Flee. Get away. Run. I, I actually looked up what flee, you know, the definition of flee in the Greek. You know what it is? Flee. <laughs> flee. Run. Stay away from it. Get away from it. Don't even get close to it because it will burn you. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high, high, holy cow. God bought you with a price. His only son. Here in a second... The worship team is going to come on up. I think some of them already are. Here in a second, we're going to take a little bit of time at the end of the service, and, and we, we kind of open up the altar, right? Here's what I want to challenge you with today. I think a lot of times you walk into a church, and, and you have a stigma because you've made mistakes. I think you've, you've made decisions, and for some of you, you've made some decisions that you've, you've spent the rest of your life regretting. For some of you, it was... Uh, Back seat of a car in high school. For some of you, it was a spring break. For some of you, it was some wild, crazy college days. Some of you grew up in the 60s. For some of you, it was at a workplace. And you're tap dancing down some lines right now that, that you don't need to be around. Can I just encourage you with something? Grass isn't greener on the other side. Grass is greener where you water it. And if you'll spend as much time in communication with your spouse as you are with, the, with your boss or the coworker that you're flirting with, that your marriage will be enhanced and not destroyed. But for some of you, you've started down that road. It's innocent. It's flirty. It's cute. You'll say things like, oh, they understand me. Your spouse will understand you too if you sit down and talk. But here's what I want to encourage you as we wrap up today. It's a weird subject to talk about in church. I get it. I get it. There's, there's not a lot of, whoo, charge the hill. But here's the deal. For some of you, you've lived with guilt. You've lived with shame. You're even living with it right now. When I said, head your phone over, you cringed. For some of you, you want to stop, but you can't. Late at night when it's just you, you want to stop, and then you don't. And then you feel shame, and you feel guilt, and you feel regret, and it's this perpetual cycle. And here's what I know. The enemy's alive and well, and he's out to seek, kill, and destroy. And he's out to seek, kill, and destroy your relationships. And his number one tool to do it with is this topic today. As the altar comes up, and I know this is going to be a weird one, right? Because it's like, if I go to the altar, they're going to know that I struggle. Right? I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll be the first one. I'll come down here. Because I struggle. I struggle with it. I've had to put boundaries up. I've had to put people in my life to help me with it. My wife knows all about it. We've had some very, very, very weird conversations. But here's what I know. From the boundaries around our marriage, to the conversations, to the people I've allowed in this, we have a stronger marriage now because we dealt with it than we ever would have by pretending it didn't exist. This morning, I want us as a church to stop pretending that it doesn't exist. <laughs> because it does, and it's in this room. So I want to challenge you today. Maybe it needs to be you and your spouse. Teenagers, maybe it needs to be you and your parents. It's awkward. But man, don't let the enemy win. Don't look back and say, I wish I had. Start today, the first step 
of making it right. God, I pray this morning, as we go into the world, the world does a great job with all the lights and the shiny and the flashy of of how glamorous this is, but God, I've seen over and over how this destroys relationships. God, I pray this morning, if there's anybody in this room this morning that's struggling with any of this, if there's anybody in this morning that has made the decision that is stuck with them for the rest of their life and they're living in guilt and they're living in shame and they're living in condemnation, that God, this morning, that they would be set free. And God, they would realize that you are the one who can set them free. That there's not a mistake too bad that you won't forgive. There's not a life too far gone that you can't restore. That God, that restoration begins this morning right here, right now. Awkward conversation. But one, I am so glad that you have the grace and the power of restoration in our marriages, in our relationships, and in our lives. We're going to give you all the glory in Jesus' name.